Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. And one of the things I like about Darren Aronofsky's uh, portrayal of, the, of Noah is that he takes it from something that you probably heard as a children's story and makes it something very much that it is. It's an adult story, okay? Uh, the story of the flood is closer to The Walking Dead than to Disney Pixar, okay? That's the level of intensity here. But we teach it to children because kids need to understand important principles that come from Noah's Ark. And one of the great things uh, that we do is we teach our kids in ways that they can understand. My daughter, for instance, understands bad dreams as having bad storms in your room. The reason why she calls bad dreams bad storms in her room is because that is the kind of bad dreams that she has. I'm excited to hear that really the only thing she's afraid of are bad storms. I feel like that validates my parenting a little bit. I'm like, oh, you're scared of a little weather. That's great. Today, I want us to talk about Noah's Ark. Because there's bad storms in our room. There's bad storms in our lives. There's chaos in our lives. And we, when we go to bed at night, when we go to sleep, a lot of us have nightmares. A lot of us can't sleep because of the bad storms that are in our room, that are in our house. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's a pursuit of comfort and security, and you're constantly chasing after that, and so it's disruptive to the rest of your life. Maybe it's success. You're just always chasing success. And it creates chaos in every other part of your life. It's like water that just spreads everywhere. I don't know what it is today, but there is chaos in our life. There's things that we do that we have pursued that are incredibly self-destructive. And I want us to talk about that today. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6. And if you're with us in the additional seating, thank you so much uh, for being there and being a part of our service today. Uh, we appreciate you giving up uh, a space for those who are new. So we're in Genesis chapter 6, and I want us to talk about sin, chaos, and God's rescue. So the first thing you need to see is that sin leads to chaos. Sin leads to chaos. Now before we dive into the passage, I want you to understand something about the Bible that's in your hands. It is a piece of literature. It's a lot of other things. It's the inspired Word of God, but it's also a piece of literature, and it's a good piece of literature too. And the way that we know that is the Bible doesn't always come right out and tell you what it means. Usually it does, but sometimes it uses pictures and imagery. And one of the best images in the Bible is water. And as you read through Year of the Bible with us, you'll see water come up a number of times. Water is always, usually, kind of this chaos idea. It's chaos. You see it in Genesis 1. The Spirit of God hovers over the waters, and the earth, earth was formless and void. Formless and void, if you Google search the word chaos, that is a definition of chaos. Formless and void. You see it today in Noah's Ark story. There's chaos coming up out of the waters. It's destructive chaos. You see it in Exodus 14, when the Israelites' back are up against the wall with the Red Sea. They're threatened to be destroyed by chaos or by Pharaoh. Take your pick. You see it in the Psalms, 46, 69, 89. Water is often a representation as an obstacle to God's people and a threat to them. But it's also something that God can use to bring salvation and deliverance to his people and to punish those who are trying to harm his people and who have sinned against God. So chaos can be good and it can be bad. There's a good kind of chaos, right? And the good kind of chaos is the chaos that's usually on its way to creation, so some of you are going to go home today and you're going to cook meals for the week because you're way ahead of life than I am. And your kitchen is going to look like a bomb went off in there. And as a clean freak like me, I'm like, oh, I just want to wash your dishes. But that's good chaos. It's on its way to creation. If you organize something in your room, you usually take stuff out of the closet. And it's a big disaster area and you put everything back. If you have small children in your house, you live in a flood of chaos. But it's a good kind of chaos. It shows that there's life and vibrancy in your home, right? But there's also a bad kind of chaos. And the bad kind of chaos usually comes from sin. Now, I want us to understand sin in two ways here. One, sin is the things that you do that violate God's commands for your life. That's the self-inflicted, self-destructive kind of sin, right? 
So abuse, affairs, lying, cheating, stealing, murdering, violence, those are self-inflicted sins. We take part in those. But there's also a chaos that comes from living in a sinful world. For instance, purposelessness. Many of us, some of us, feel purposeless in our lives. That's a byproduct of sin. In fact, uh, one of our pastors on staff was telling me, I think it was David, Huey, that was telling me that in China there's an iPhone factory and there's people who work there and their job is to screw in one screw and then just do the next one and the next one. And they eventually had to set up nets around the factory because people were jumping to their deaths because they found such meaninglessness in what they did. Purposelessness is a byproduct of sin. It's an environmental condition of living in a sinful world since Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Disease that we deal with. It's not because you sinned. You don't get cancer because you sinned. You get cancer because we live in a sinful world. And that's a bad kind of chaos. So I want us to focus in on bad chaos today as we look at Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to start reading in verse 5. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. That doesn't mean like, oh man, I made a mistake. That means that God looks and and is just heartbroken over what his creation has become. And it grieved him to his heart. And so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Skip down to verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Okay, so we've we've, we've arrived at Noah. From Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel, and then there's these generations of violence. And it's become a systematic way of life. Violence is what is ruling the earth. And it's funny... It's interesting that as we look at this passage, you might think to yourself, well, things just got really bad. Like they were lying, they were cheating, they were stealing, they were sleeping with each other. No, that's not what was going on. I mean, probably some of that was going on. But it's violence. Look back at the passage again. Look at verse uh, 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. Violence is the problem. Why is violence the problem? Because human beings are made in the image of God. And if I attack the image of God, I am attacking the creator itself. It's why Cain kills Abel. Cain is kind of mad at Abel, but he's really mad at God. But he can't kill God, so I'll kill the thing that's made in his image. And this becomes a systemic way of life. This is what's happening. And it corrupts the earth. The word corrupt can mean to disfigure, to spoil, or to ruin Mankind is corrupting. So mankind was created in the image of God. They were created to bear the image of God into the world, rule and reign, to bring order to God's creation. And now they're doing the opposite. They're undoing it. They're bringing chaos. They're bringing destruction. And God says, that's enough. That's enough. I'm going to, you want chaos, we'll do chaos. We'll send the world right back to where it started, covered with water, formless and void. And that's what he decides to do. And if we believe that bad chaos, to be complete disorder and confusion, because that's what it is, it's not very hard to see that sin in our lives, disobedience to God's will, is often a direct source of chaos in our lives. I mean, think about it. It's why we have laws, right? Like, imagine no laws governing how you drive on the road. Some of you have been to countries where it seems like there are no laws governing how you drive on the road. It would be mad chaos. Imagine living in a society where somebody could walk into your house and take what they want because they're bigger than you, and there's no laws penalizing them. Werner Herzog said, civilization is a thin layer of ice upon a deep ocean of chaos and darkness. We see it in society. We also see it in our personal lives, right? I usually get one day a week where neither my wife nor I are working. And this is Saturday, right? And so Saturday, we usually get together. We have some errands to run. But every once in a while, probably more often than I'd like, I wake up on Saturday morning. And if this is the right side of the bed, I wake up somewhere on Northwest Highway where I'm just grumpy and irritable. And I introduce chaos into the Garden of Eden that is our Saturday. I get angry I get irritated. We don't go to where I want to go for lunch. We don't actually go out to lunch, which is what I want to do. Whatever it is, I get frustrated. 
and I introduce chaos into my family, into a really good day. I can also introduce chaos into my children's lives for years and decades. Because sometimes if I want to withhold love or hold affection from my children because I wasn't really shown how to do that, I can make my children question that my love and affection for them for the rest of their lives. And it introduces this chaos into their little hearts and they carry with it, it with them for the rest of their lives. All because I couldn't say three words, I love you. I can create chaos at work, Right? So I treat my job less like a garden of flourishing and a place where everybody's trying to find their purpose, and instead I treat it like the Hunger Games. And I gotta be the last one standing, because I'm Katniss, baby. (laughs) We're gonna make sure that I'm the one standing on top of this hill. Yeah. And so it's just this big, chaotic mass of people climbing over the top of people's shattered careers trying to reach the top of the ladder. It's chaos. My penchant to pursue my selfish desires makes it where I do not pursue God's will for my life, which is to obey his commands and to bear his image. And it creates disorder, chaos, and destruction, a deep, dark, self-inflicted chaos. And we have a God who is a good God. And because he is a good God, he does not let our self-inflicted chaos go on. Because God punishes sin. God punishes sin. So I want us to skip a little bit. And what I want us to skip, when I was reading my commentaries this week, getting ready, they said the hardest thing about this passage is covering all of the text in a reasonable amount of sermon time. So we're not going to be here till 2 o'clock today. Uh, I'm going to skip to chapter 7, verse 17. And basically the part that I'm skipping is the part that you learned in Sunday school. Noah builds an ark, and he gets animals two by two on the ark, and then water starts. And in verse 17, it says, The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, Beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed on the earth a hundred and fifty days. Just in case you missed it, everything died. So there's a tension in the story. You're going to remember how I said the Bible is a really good story. In a good story, there's something that happens. It's called tension. And we lose it because we've heard this story since we were born. But you are supposed to feel afraid here. Because you are supposed to feel like things have gotten out of control. You're supposed to feel like, oh my gosh, has God gone too far this time? Look at the passage. The waters increased, verse 17. Verse 18, the waters prevailed and increased. That means prevailed means they're winning. Waters prevailed, verse 19. Waters prevailed over the mountains, 20. Waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days, verse 24. Then in verse 21, all flesh died. Verse 22, everything with breath died. Verse 23, he blotted out every living thing. They were blotted out from the earth. What you're supposed to feel when you read this paragraph is God has lost his mind. He has gone too far this time. His judgment was too harsh, and now it's so big that he can't even control it. The floodwaters, the chaos, is supposed to have taken on a life of its own. And the reason why you're supposed to feel this is because in every other ancient Near Eastern story that has an uh, an account of the flood, the gods that create it, most of the stories anyway, the gods that create it, it gets so out of control that they get scared and they run away. So when you read the Epic of Gilgamesh that has the flood story in it, guess what? The gods get freaked out and they run away from it. So you're supposed to be reading this if you're familiar with other ancient Near Eastern stories and you're supposed to be sitting there going, and this is the part where God abandons Noah. This is the part where he runs away because God's chaos, God's punishment has gotten out of control. And that's how a lot of us view God's wrath and God's judgment, something that's out of control, something that's unbridled. Like God's throwing this mad temper tantrum is just throwing toys at people 
until they get hit in the head with them. You just better get out of the way. But that's not how God operates. That's not how he works. God is always in control, and he's always especially in control of himself. So one, the flood is not out of control. How do we know this? Well, it's doing exactly what it was supposed to do. Verse 13 of chapter 6. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The flood is doing exactly what God said it was supposed to do. And you might think, okay, well, fine, but isn't God overreacting here? Like, couldn't we have saved some more people? Yeah, here's the thing. Uh, God didn't just have a knee-jerk reaction. Look at verse 5 of chapter 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now, this saw doesn't mean like God was walking along one day and was like, man, I haven't checked in on earth lately. How's it? Oh, my gosh. What happened? I leave you guys alone for five minutes. And No, that's not what happened. God is investigating. The word saw means he's investigating, he's inspecting, he's weighing his options, he's considering what do I do about this? And God's conclusion, which is always the right conclusion to come to, because whatever God does is right, God is just, is to wipe out all living things on the earth except for one man, his family, and a handful of animals. And God's, the story of the ark although it is something in the past, it's also something that's a part of our future. Because God will judge the earth again. And a lot of us don't like to talk about this. It's uncomfortable. You want like positive, happy message. I get that. We do that a lot here. But we need to talk today about God's judgment. And I want us to look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to come back to Noah. Don't worry, we're not going to leave him on the ark. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. And the reason why I want to use 2 Peter is there's a lot of places we could go to talk about God's coming judgment of the earth. But Peter is great in that he uses Noah's ark as an image to talk about God's future judgment of the earth. So the first thing you need to know about God's judgment is that it's certain. It's certain. 2 Peter 3 verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. That's what scoffers do. Following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So ever since the fathers fell asleep, those fathers, that's the antediluvian fathers, which antediluvian is a big word that means before the flood fathers. Everything's been good since then. We don't have to worry about worldwide judgment. But Peter's coming behind them and saying, actually, you kind of do, because Jesus talked about it. He talks about it a lot. Jesus talks about hell, uh, punishment, wrath. He actually talks about it quite a bit. It's certain. It's coming. There will come a day when Christ will return and he will set his house in order. It's a scary thought. Let's keep reading and see if we need to still be afraid. Verse uh, 5, God's wrath is also a part of his justice. His judgment is a part of his justice. Verse 5, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. That can also read, the earth was formed out of chaos and through chaos by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world was, that then existed was deluged with water or chaos and perished. But the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So before he used water, next he's going to use fire. It's a part of God's justice. So notice what it says at the very end of the passage we read, destruction of the ungodly. God's wrath is a part of his justice. Now you and I both want bad people to be punished, right? There are people walking around in our society today and around in the world who've murdered people, who've raped people, who've abused children, and they are walking around free. And you know what's going to happen? We are never going to catch them. It is unreasonable to think that we will catch every single person and punish them adequately for what they have done. At the same time, there are people sitting in jail who didn't do what they were accused of doing. But because we have an imperfect justice system, there they sit. God's judgment and wrath is a part of his justice. We want God to punish those who have done wrong. 
I do. I have a strong sense of justice. I don't want people to get... People don't use their blinker on the road, and I'm mad about it. <laughs> right? I'm like, come on. It's a, it's a common courtesy. I want justice. You want justice. You know what I don't want, though? I don't want to be on the wrong end of that. I don't want to be included in that justice. In fact, if I could, I'd like to call the shots and say who gets what where, if I'm really honest with myself. God's wrath, his judgment, is a part of his justice. Everybody doesn't get off scot-free because God is holy and God is just and he punishes sin. So let's keep reading. God's judgment is also patient. It's patient, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact. I love the but there. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. I bet when you quoted that passage before, you didn't know it was in the context of like judgment and wrath. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So if you ever wonder why is Jesus not coming back yet? Why is he waiting so long? It's been 2,000 years. I'm starting to doubt whether he'll come at all. This is why. He's waiting. He might even be waiting on you. One person to come to know him and avoid the judgment, the wrath that is coming. Jesus doesn't want to punish you. That's why he died on the cross for our sins. So that you have a way out. There's an escape. There's an ark for you. It's the person and work of Jesus Christ. So God is patient. His justice, his judgment is patient. And then lastly, we read that his judgment is specific. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? Okay, Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God's judgment is specific. So remember how we thought that God's judgment is like a temper tantrum and just whoever gets on the wrong side of it gets on the wrong side? That's not what happens. God's judgment is specific. Those who are subject to wrath will be subject to wrath. Those who are not will not be because here's the difference. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have believed that Jesus' cross, his death, burial, and resurrection pays for God's wrath. It, 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 it appeases God's wrath. You don't have to worry about it anymore. In fact, you've been probably taught since you were little that there'll come a day of judgment for you as a believer. And you've probably been taught that there's going to be this like movie where God watches like your whole life and like points out like a coach in film time, points out like all the things you did wrong. That's not what's going to happen if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the best way I can relate judgment to you is going in for a performance review at work with a boss that you know that really loves you. In fact, maybe your dad that loves you is the boss and he's already told you, dude, you're getting a raise and a bonus. We're just gonna talk about how much you got. I want that meeting. I don't know about you. Romans 8.1, we cannot learn it well enough. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of judgment if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Jesus, then fear is a reasonable response. But you do not have to stay afraid. There is hope, there is salvation in Jesus Christ. We use this expression, Jesus saves, right? You see it places, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. But we often drop, well, what's he saving us from? Because it's uncomfortable. He's saving us from the wrath of God. He's saving us from the wrath of God. It's why we worship the way that we worship. It's why we live our lives devoted to him as an act of gratitude. Because through Christ, we have been saved from the wrath of God. Now, if we leave the story here, if we leave Noah in the ark, if we leave just talking about judgment, it's kind of a bummer of an ending, isn't it? It's kind of sad. But that is not where we're going to leave our story. Let's go back to Genesis 8. Genesis 8, 
Because God can rescue you from chaos. God can rescue you from chaos. Genesis 8, 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock. I want to read this again. But God remembered. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed and the rain from the heavens were restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month of the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. I'm going to stop there because basically you get the idea. The water is receding. It's going away. God did not have water out of control. In fact, God was in total control the whole time. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. But God remembered. He remembered Noah. He spares him. And if you notice, Genesis 8 sounds a lot like a a chapter we've already read. Genesis 1. Right? So in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God, the word Spirit is Ruach, Ruach, depending on how Hebrew you want to get with it, here hovers over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. Genesis 8, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were in him in the ark, and God made a wind to blow. The word wind also is Ruach. God is recreating out of chaos, right? The waters have sucked up the world, formless and void. Now he's recreating. He's starting with Noah. Noah's going to be this new Adam. And as you read the story, you you see again that Noah fails in a garden just like Adam failed in a garden. But God's starting over here. God is reorganizing chaos into creation. He hasn't forgotten them. And as we read through Year of the Bible, one of the things that you can do as you're reading through, and if you haven't picked it up yet, you really should. Uh, We're only like 2% of the way through the Bible, so we just started Exodus. You've missed like not even the opening credits of the Bible. Like if you want to look at it as a two-hour movie, okay, you haven't even really gotten that far. So get your popcorn and join us for Year of the Bible for the rest of the year. But one of the phrases you'll see, and one of the things is this word remember. Now remember doesn't mean like, oh snap, like <laughs> that was today, I got Noah, like dang it, I need to go get him. No, it's, it's God remembers his commitment and he acts upon it. Remembering always means acting upon it, right? So God remembers In Exodus 2.24, God remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he begins to set in motion the events that will set Israel free from Egypt. In Judges, the big old Samson, strong man, uh, cries out to God and says, I want you to remember me so that I can have vengeance on my enemies, the Philistines. And God does it. God remembers him. It occurs in the Psalms quite a bit. It also occurs in Revelation when God remembers his people and he punishes Babylon, which Babylon is like this uh, metaphor for everything that is evil and wrong in the world. But probably the best place that the word remember happens is in Luke chapter 23, verse 42. There are three men being killed outside of a city. Two of them are thieves. Or another way to understand the Greek word for thief there is insurrectionists, anarchists, people who make their trade in fomenting chaos and destruction. They want to overthrow Rome. They want to overthrow the government. Basically, they want to be at the center of the universe. And in between these two insurrectionists is another man, and he's the son of God, Jesus Christ. You've probably heard this story before. But one of the insurrectionists looks at Jesus at some point and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. I don't know if you realize the irony of this statement. Here's a man who has spent his entire life creating chaos. The idea of being a part of somebody's kingdom other than his own would have been horrible to this man. And yet he turns to another man who's being crucified and he says, remember me. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of your rule and reign. I want to serve you. Remember me. And the most astounding thing is that any king in his right mind would have looked at a political insurrectionist and would have said, you're out of your mind. Go somewhere else. But Jesus says the opposite. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. You are a citizen of my kingdom today, right now. Remember me. And if you have seen in your life chaos and destruction, whether it is self-inflicted or otherwise, 
you got bad storms in your room. Your prayer today can be the same as that thief, that anarchist, that chaos monger on the cross. Remember me. Remember me. Lord Jesus, remember me. Because I've got chaos in my life. Maybe for you it's an addiction. You're just trapped in something and you can't get out. And, and you've tried to get out. You've tried all sorts of stuff. And you see the destruction that it's causing in your family and your friends. Maybe your friends are just tired of you. And you can look to the Lord today and you can say, remember me. You think God thinks you're icky and ugly and, and, and dirty and disgusting. Not in Christ. In Christ, we are all clothed in his righteousness. God thinks we're beautiful. Maybe it's your romantic life. There's chaos there. Or maybe your romantic life is non-existent and you would wish for a little chaos. Maybe you've idolized marriage for so long that there's no way any one human being could ever live up to that standard. Maybe you're in a marriage. And the person that you're married to, again, because you've idolized marriage so much, there's no way that person can live up to it. And so there's chaos in your marriage because you're expecting somebody to be perfect. Or maybe you've got your job, and your job is just a place of chaos. Like I said, it's just one after another of climbing on top of the bodies of your enemies that you, as you climb the, rag, the, the rungs of a ladder. But there's chaos. You're just not happy there. But you cannot stop chasing money and greed and fame. Or maybe you've just got anger inside of you. You're mad. There's a, bad storms in your heart of chaos. And you're just waiting to blow up. You know it's coming. Everybody does too. Maybe you're a teenager. And your life is like chaotic. Well, welcome to being a teenager for some ex to some extent. But you're at home and, and you treat your parents terribly. You call them names and you don't even like that you do it. You don't even really feel that way. But you feel like nobody really understands. And so you're just, you just chewed up with chaos. And you let that chaos spill out because you don't really know how to deal with it. Right? Or maybe there's something going on in your life that I can't even fathom, begin to understand. Because I'm not you. Again, we cry out to the Lord. And we say, remember me. Remember me. You can ask God to remember you because God wants to be with you. He didn't forget Noah. He's not going to forget you. God graciously and protected, watched over Noah. He wants to graciously watch over you. He wants to take the bad storms in your life and call the, cause the rain to cease and let the waters abate. Let them recede. You don't have to have bad storms in your room. If you're not a follower of Jesus, it's an opportunity today to seek Christ, maybe for the first time, and say goodbye to fear of judgment and punishment. Say goodbye to chaos and look to Jesus Christ if you believe in his person and his work, if you believe that what he did on the cross counts for you, guess what? You are saved. And he will remember you. If you're a believer today, and you look at your life and you're like, well, Travis, I, I got Jesus, but I still got some chaos. Guess what? I do too. I struggle with anxiety. I haven't slept a full night this month. That's chaos in my life. It affects every thing else. But we can turn prayerfully to the Word of God and seek healing from our chaos. Why? Because it's the Word of God. This is the Word of God. It's a book, but it's also the Word of God. And what is it that causes, calls things into creation? God speaks and it happens. What is it, how is it that God calmed the waters around Noah? The wind blows. That wind is His Spirit, the Word going forth. Jesus calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee. What does he do? He rebukes it. And yes, that story is a reference to Noah's Ark. A bunch of people in a boat, water's out of control. Jesus is making a claim that he's God in doing that. Turn to the Word of God. It's not just a book. It is everything you need to be free of chaos. You can turn to other people, too. Come to, turn to the church. So my daughter, the way we found out that bad storms in her room were her way of saying she has bad dreams. She's two, by the way. It maybe helps the story some. It's not like I have a 13-year-old daughter that doesn't know what bad dreams are. But she says she has bad storms in her room. And you know how she knows? is because I told her that I have bad dreams too. And she looked at me and the light went off. 
And she said, Dada has bad storms in his room too. I don't know what you're going through today, but I got bad storms in my room. And you do too. We all have bad storms in our room. So let's get in the boat together. Because it is through wood and nails that Jesus has saved us, just like God saved Noah with wood and nails. Jesus used the cross. So if you're a guy in here today that's trying to follow Jesus Christ and you need help, there is a men's breakfast Saturday morning that starts at 7 a.m. It's a great place for you to see if that might be a place where you can find brothers who are trying to battle the bad storms in their room. An hour of your time on a Saturday morning is well worth the hope of a lifetime of freedom from chaos. If you're a teenager, there's a thing that happens on Wednesday nights. It's called Crew. It's a great place for you to talk with people who do understand what you're going through or at the very least want to understand what you're going through. It is well worth your time and energy and effort. They want to help you and they want to help your parents help you. God rescued Noah and his family and his, and his family's family from a global flood. He can rescue you from the chaos in your life. All it takes is for you to turn to him and say, remember me. Sin causes chaos, and God punishes sin, but we can ask that the Lord would rescue us from chaos, that he would remember us. So let's go to him now and ask him to remember. Lord God, come to you now and we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would remember us, that you would help us battle the waves in our lives. Maybe, maybe today can be the day that we all look back and we say, Lord God, you are incredible. Lord God, you can help me. You can rescue me. You can set the waters aright. And we might see the rain stop today in life. We might see the waters begin to abate and to drain. Maybe that won't end the chaos permanently, but today might be the day where it starts. And the rocky boat that is our life might come to rest on a mountain of God's grace. So Lord God, we look to you for rescue. I'm proud of this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.